from the basics here as a chairman. Um, but th thank you very much for that. Uh, it's, the subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on promoting conservation with a purpose on America's federal lands and forests. I ask unanim unanimous consent that the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman, the gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Hoyle, and the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Moore, be allowed to participate in today's hearing from the dais. Without objection, so ordered. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and the ranking minority member. I therefore ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted in accordance with committee rule 3.0. Without objection, so ordered. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. First of all, um, it is a great privilege to be able to uh, chair the subcommittee on federal lands. I wanna thank um, the chairman of the committee, uh, Mr. Westerman, for, giving, for having the confidence to allow me to do that. And I look forward to working with the ranking member here, uh, Mr. Nagus, um, to have a vibrant, um, good debate and what um, staff is telling me is one of the busiest subcommittees in natural resources and I really look forward to that. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of our members returning and new and I'm excited to work with all of you this Congress as we address the many pressing issues affecting our federal lands and forests. The topic of today's hearing is promoting conservation with a purpose on America's federal lands and forests. This is an important subject and I hope the discussion that ensues will help establish some guiding principles of federal land management and conservation for this subcommittee to follow. It could also not be coming at a more critical moment. Our federal land management agencies are facing a suite of unpre unprecedented crises, bleak forest health conditions and catastrophic megafires crumbling infrastructure and skyrocketing deferred maintenance, environmental degradation at our southern border, disappearing access and recreation opportunities, overcrowding and diminished economic opportunities for local communities. As a nation, we are blessed with abundant natural resources on our federal lands. There are roughly 640 million acres of federal land across the country, which is 28% of the entire land base. I might be biased, but my district in northern Wisconsin, which contains a million and a half of those acres, are some of the finest federal lands in the country in the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest. When done well, federal lands are carefully managed to balance the multiple uses and needs of the American people in a way that ensures they will be protected and enjoyed by generations to come. This is what we mean when we say conservation with a purpose. Sadly, true conservation of our federal lands has been increasingly hamstrung by a preservationist agenda being pushed by extreme environmentalists, including those in the Biden administration. Under the guise of protecting the environment, these extremists have pushed for locking up vast swaths of land under restrictive land designations, shutting down active management and responsible resource development through burdensome regulations, and when all else fails, filing frivolous lawsuits. Extreme environmentalists have also hijacked the word conservation to promote policies straight out of the preservationist playbook. Look no further than the Biden administration's only own 30 by 30 initiative and ill-defined unscientific policy. Under the guise of conservation, 30 by 30 has supported nothing but preservationist land designations and a $1 billion slush fund. Of course, this is hardly a surprise given the fact that the nonpartisan Congressional Research Service has calculated 39% of lands are already considered protected in the United States of America. Preservation has failed to yield promised environmental protection. Instead, preservation exacerbates the challenges facing federal land managers by hindering their ability to use science-based active management techniques. There is a better way to manage our lands. We owe it to the American people to support land management practices that lead to more resilient communities, better environmental outcomes, and greater access and opportunities for the American people. That's part of the commitment to America, which set forth principles to achieve these results by pursuing, pursuing innovative pro-growth solutions that responsibly expedite regulatory processes, reduce 
frivolous litigation, restore scientifically sound management, and remove arbitrary barriers blocking access to our federal lands and forests. Achieving these outcomes will require empowering local communities and stakeholders to collaborate and coordinate on federal land management efforts. People that live closest to these lands are often the best stewards because they understand the unique challenges they face and have a vested interest in entering, ensuring that they are left in a better condition for future generations. That's why today we will hear from state, tribal, and local witnesses about the importance of coordination and what true conservation should look like on our federal lands and forests. I look forward to hearing their unique perspectives I want to thank all the witnesses for being with us, and I look forward to today's discussion. With that, I will now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Nagus, for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to say congratulations to you on your chairmanship, and certainly looking forward to working with you. have had the privilege of working with you uh, previously on this subcommittee and in the, the broader committee, and I'm certainly excited about the work ahead. Glad to join you today and our colleagues uh, from both sides of the aisle for the inaugural meeting of the Federal Land Subcommittee in the 118th Congress. Uh, also want to welcome in particular our newer members. I know we have a number of, uh, of freshman members of Congress who are serving on this subcommittee both uh, in, uh, from the Republican side and the Democratic side, and we're very, very grateful to have them participating. Uh, I had the privilege, as you all uh, will recall, of serving as chairman of this subcommittee in the last Congress. And my experience taught me during the course of the last two years that this subcommittee is really a workhorse. And I was very grateful to hear the chairman talk a bit about that. And I think it's helpful to kind of do a little bit of level setting as we kick off the year. In the 117th Congress, just by way of background, we processed and moved more standalone pieces of legislation in this subcommittee than any other natural resources subcommittee. And we did so. Uh, in a bipartisan manner. The full committee, the Natural Resources Committee under Chairman Grijalva, marked up 68 bills that were referred to this subcommittee last Congress. 38 of those bills were sponsored by Democrats. 30 were sponsored by Republicans. And that was really important to me uh, as the subcommittee chair to ensure that this subcommittee operated in a bipartisan manner. And I believe this is the case, of course, uh, we have uh, you know, a bevy of folks that can fact check it, that no other subcommittee in the United States Congress in the last Congress functioned in that way as this subcommittee did in terms of the volume and the, the, threat, the percentages between Republican bills and Democratic bills. 49 of those bills that I mentioned passed the House, uh, and an impressive 74 were enacted into law either as standalones or as part of a larger package. Again, most of that work was done on a very bipartisan basis, with one-third of those bills being sponsored by my Republican colleagues. Uh, it was a priority for our subcommittee, and I think, uh, I, or I certainly hope that uh, the former ranking member, my friend from Idaho, Mr. Fulcher, uh, would uh, concur with that. Uh, but it was something we took very serious, and I certainly hope, uh, as chairman, uh, that, uh, that you will take that same approach, and, and I have no doubt that uh, that, that will be the case, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to have the spirited and robust debate that I know we will have on, uh, on issues over the course of the next two years. Before I move on to the topic of today's hearing, because this is the first hearing uh, of this particular subcommittee, I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to discuss the crisis that really is engulfing the West right now, and that is the Western drought. Whether you are in an upper basin state like myself or Mr. Curtis or uh, our, our new member from uh, the state of Wyoming or one of the lower basin states, it is very clear uh, that we have a crisis on our hands. The drought conditions along the Colorado River year after year uh, are something simply that we can't ignore. I represent a district in northern Colorado that includes the headwaters of the Colorado River. So for us, this is very real. And as we talk about conservation, I certainly hope and understanding that there's a separate subcommittee on water uh, that many of us serve on, that nonetheless, we can talk a bit here about our work to protect watersheds and water sources. And I certainly look forward to uh, doing that work with Chairman Tiffany and my colleagues. With respect to conservation, uh, look, I, I think the record is clear that in the last Congress, we made significant progress during our time in the majority on that issue. Uh, through President Biden's infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, as you all know, we passed historic levels of funding to promote resilience, restoration, conservation across public lands. A lot of that work 
was informed by the hearings that uh, we held right here in this subcommittee with witnesses like yourselves, uh, hearings that provided opportunities for federal land management agencies, scientists, local officials, community stakeholders, wide range of public land users to be able to come in and, and provide us with insight about conservation potential of our federal lands and forests. And now, the good news is that the generational investments that we enacted last Congress are financing projects literally across the Rocky Mountain West that were designed to mitigate the worst effects of the climate crisis, keeping communities safe, restoring damaged ecosystems. We're talking literally about hundreds of millions of dollars in investments to promote resiliency across public lands, mitigation. We see these investments having real world impacts with respect to wildfire. Just by one example, a significant concern, of course, to my district and I know to many of my colleagues here who represent the West. The Biden administration has been utilizing these resources to partner with states, with counties. I hope we'll hear about some of that today, uh, as well as key stakeholders to treat millions of acres within our national forests, particularly in the most at-risk fire sheds. That work is crucially important. And again, it's a generational investment um, whose time has certainly come. But there is more to be done. And uh, we will certainly be introducing legislation in the coming weeks uh, and months with our colleagues to address some of those uh, concerns. Now, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a bit about public lands preservation as we talk about conservation. Uh, I, of course, uh, have a bill that I am particularly uh, supportive of, which is the uh, Colorado Outdoor Recreation and Economy Act, the CORE Act, community-driven legislation that would protect thousands of acres of land in Colorado. But there are many other bills uh, of a similar nature that have been introduced by colleagues of mine on my side of the aisle, and I certainly hope that we'll have an opportunity to consider some of those bills as well uh, over the coming two years. So we'll simply close by saying I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be able to serve as ranking member to serve with you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to the work ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ranking Member Nagus. We will now move on to our witnesses. Let me remind the witnesses that under committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. To begin your testimony, please press the on button on the microphone. We use timing lights. When you begin, the light will turn green. At the end of five minutes, the light will turn red. And I will ask you to please complete your statement at that time if you're continuing. I will also allow all witnesses to testify before member questioning. First of all, I'll introduce Mr. Joel Ferry, the Executive Director of the Utah Department of Natural Resources. Mr. Ferry is a fifth generation farmer who operates a ranch, farm, feedlot, and hunting properties in Corrine, Utah. Corrine? Uh, Corrine, but Corrine. yes. Corrine, okay. so close. Prior to his role with the Department of Natural Resources, Mr. Ferry served in the Utah House of Representatives. Mr. Ferry, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. It's, a, it's an honor being here with you today. Um, and this is a, a subject and a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I want to talk about federal um, interaction with, with the state of Utah on the lands that are uh, in the state of Utah. So federal land ownership is significantly higher in the western United States than in other regions. And in Utah in particular, the fe federal government owns over 60% of the land in our state. Um, only Nevada has more federally owned land in the lower 48 than Utah does. Utah's home to 13 national parks and millions of acres managed by federal agencies, including Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, the health and viability of our forests, our wildlands, and our watersheds have a direct impact on downstream natural resources, like the Great Salt Lake, which is in peril. As directed by the uh, FLIPMA and the National Forest Management Act, smart, collaborative conservation is most effective when federal land use plans are consistent with plans and policies of the states and local governments. And this integration is critical as state and local plans and policies incorporate local scientific data and reflect the needs of the nearby communities. Um, Utah's natural resources are healthier, more resilient, more productive, when actively managed across ownership boundaries and management. And management like this must occur regularly and at a watershed and local community scale. And this can only be accomplished by working together. In Utah, we've impl implemented several different programs that are collaborative efforts between the federal government and the state. Those programs include the Watershed Restoration Initiative, which has invested over the past 17 years 
Um, we've done over 2,500 projects and invested hundreds of millions of dollars and protected uh, over two point, or not protected, but enhanced and improved over 2.4 million acres within our watershed and our forests. Another program that we started four years ago is the Shared Stewardship Program. This is a collaborative effort between the Forest Service and the state of Utah. We've been able to invest over $30 million in protected and enhanced and removed um, old growth and, and regenerated our forests on over 80,000 acres. These have both been very successful programs that I think are an example of how Utah is leading the nation in managing our, um, our federal lands and coordinating with our federal government. In addition, recently, the last few years, we created the Office of Outdoor Recreation and Department of Outdoor Recreation within our state government that promotes outdoor recreation on our federal lands. And this is a collaborative effort between the state and the federal government. Now, despite these successes, we still face serious obstacles. And the most significant obstacle is the National Environmental Policy Act, so NEPA, and the way it's hamstrings the effective land management by our federal partners. The act was well-intentioned, but has become the hook for litigation by those who oppose any type of active management on federal lands and forests. NEPA has become a tool to prevent grazing, energy development, and mining on critical, of critical minerals that American industries, including the renewable industries, need. And perhaps most relevant for our discussion today is NEPA often prevents federal agencies from thinning our forests to prevent catastrophic wildfires and by transforming uh, dying forests into healthy forests. And that was certainly not the intent of the act, but that's what it does. We are encouraged by the reforms of the Trump administration that, was, that they were undertaking, but very disappointed by the current Council on Environmental Quality and the rolling back of those reforms, endangering our conservation efforts and, this, and the administration's own stated goals. We'd also encourage the federal government to reconsider the impact of the uh, 30, uh, President Biden's 30 by 30 initiative particularly on states like Utah, where the federal government manages significant acres of public lands, Utah's not comfortable with an attempt by the administration to place even more of these lands in Utah under restrictive designations. Approximately 61% of Utah, 33 million acres of land, is federal land protected under different federal laws, regulations, like NEPA and FLIPMA. So, Working together in collaboration with our federal and local partners is always better than working in isolated silos. We've proven this in Utah. Our natural resources are more resilient, more productive, when actively managed across ownership boundaries. We have healthier watersheds, cleaner water, greater yield of water, fire-resistant landscapes, healthier wildlife populations, and more abundant outdoor recreational opportunities when we work together. As stewards of Utah's natural resources, we need your help in removing barriers that hinder our ability to actively manage the public lands. We need your continued support and investment at the individual watershed level and local level. Ongoing partnership and cooperation is necessary as we continue to work through these challenges and opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferry. I'll rec I now recognize Representative Hageman for 30 seconds to introduce our second witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it is my pleasure to introduce Carbon County Commissioner John Espy to the committee today. Commissioner John Espy is a fifth generation rancher from Rollins, Wyoming. He is a member of the Carbon County Board of Commissioners, holding this position since 2012 and has served at, as its vice chair and chair. He has served on various boards, including the Animal Damage Management Board, the Wyoming County Commissioner Association Public Lands Committee, and the Sage Grouse Implementation Team. An experienced conservationist and local government official, we are lucky to have Commissioner Espy's testimony and knowledge before this committee today. John, it's a pleasure to see you again, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you. I now recognize Commissioner Espy for five minutes. <clears throat> Chairman Tiffany, Ranking Member Negus, thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name's John Espy. I'm a fifth generation rancher and a Carbon County, Wyoming commissioner. I serve as the first vice president of the National Association of Counties Western Interstate Region and chairman of the Wyoming County Commissioner Association Agriculture, Water, State, and Public Lands Committee. Additionally, I serve on state and local task force on greater sage grouse conservation. And as Carbon County co-chair of the Wyoming Public Lands Initiative, I'm here today on behalf of the National Association of Counties. Counties offer detailed expertise on resource management issues that help achieve our mutual goals. 
our environmental and social economic values must be balanced through multiple use management, which is best achieved when federal agencies treat counties as governing partners and co-regulators by coordinating their resource management plans to ensure the consistency of those impacted counties. Counties have legal jurisdiction over certain areas and must be given the opportunity to participate as cooperating agencies from the beginning of the NEPA process to lend their expertise to better inform federal decisions. Carbon County has a population of approximately 15,000 and is home to part of the Medicine Bow Route National Forest. About 54% of Carbon County is federally owned. Our economy is directly tied to public lands. Minerals and energy production, agriculture and tourism are top industries. Counties work collaboratively with federal agencies, states, tribes, and landowners to, on a range of natural resource issues to support our local economies, our cultural heritage. Our weed and pest district funded by county taxes has treated over 50,000 acres of federal, state, and private lands for invasive weeds and grasses. Our conservation districts worked with federal agencies to remove sediment from the North Platte and Little Snake rivers. To incentivize the Forest Service and BLM to increase their use of the Good Neighbor Authority, the State Forestry Division spent 400,000 to hire per personnel for cooperative forest management projects on federal lands. After working at the local grassroots level with public land stakeholders like conservationists, recreational groups, extractive industries, and agriculturists, we submitted management recommendations on wilderness study areas that were addressed by the Wyoming Public Lands Initiative. Under the act, certain WSAs stuck in limbo since 1991 would be designated as wilderness, special management areas, or released back into multiple use. Carbon County's recommendations would designate the Encampment River Canyon, the Prospect Mountain, WSAs as wilderness, establish the Black Cat Special Management Area, and release the Bennett Mountain WSA to multiple use. In addition to petroleum and mineral production, we lead the way in renewable energy development with the Choctary Sahara Madre Wind Project that will be housed on 1,400 acres of federal, state, and private checkerboard land. This would be the largest wind farm in the U.S., providing enough electricity for one million homes. We have worked with all levels of government and private industry to ensure the project meets community needs with limited environmental impacts. It has generated millions of dollars in tax revenue, creates good paying jobs, and helps meet the president's fossil fuel reduction goals. We also boost Blue Ribbon Fishery on the North Platte River, which includes an area known as the Miracle Mile. Federal, state, and local partners ensure the North Platte remains some of the best trout habitat in the West. Every resident, local official in Carbon County recognizes how conservation of this river benefits our community. We continue to update our land use and resource management plans to adapt to environmental, economic, and community concerns. Our latest update identifies sensitive habitats that include consultation requirements with the state to mitigate migration corridor impacts. Counties are heavily engaged in species management too. We work with local, state, and federal agencies, industry, and non-governmental organizations to protect the greater sage grouse. We give particular attention to locally driven solutions supported by science that result in sustainable outcomes. Commissioners also volunteer their time, expertise across the state to participate in local working groups with federal land agencies long after the record of decision is printed. Counties remain committed to assisting our federal partners on plan implementation. Chairman Tiffany, Ranking Member Indigus, thank you for the invitation to testify today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Espy. Uh, I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. John D. Leshy, who is the Emeritus Professor at the University of California College of the Law in San Francisco. Mr. Leshy, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members, I'm uh, for the opportunity to testify here today. I'm going to give you a, a story based on um, a book I recently published, which is a political history of how the federal lands came about. Slide, then, please. Um, and um, it tells the story of the political decision. That's the cover of the book. Now, next slide, which is the uh, lands. We've all seen these. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the BLM and the Forest Service lands. I think these public lands are a great American success story. 
uh, political success story, because the story I tell is how, starting in the 1890s, uh, the Congress and the executive branch have closely collaborated, almost always in a bipartisan way, to produce the result of, uh, you see on that map. Um, the acreage that Congress uh, and the President have agreed should be held in national ownership and managed primarily for uh, uh, preservation, uh, outdoor recreation, science, uh, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the story I tell in the book is really captured in this chart. The solid line is the decisions that were made by acreage uh, on the left-hand uh, axis uh, to hold lands or acquire more lands into national ownership. The dotted line are decisions made mostly by Congress, sometimes by the executive, to protect, mostly or fully protect those lands from intensive industrialization. A couple of things to particularly note about this chart. Uh, <clears throat> one is the arc is always upward. Uh, more lands, more protection. Uh, and these are decisions that were made by uh, the political system, as I said, in a mostly bipartisan fashion, and if you trace put this against uh, what, brand, uh, what political parties in charge of Congress or the presidency, it makes almost no difference in terms of the, the uh, arc and the trajectory of this uh, slide. Um, <clears throat> so um, um, not only does the arc uh, move upward, not affected by the political uh, party considerations, uh, one other thing to note about the chart is that um, uh, the, uh, there's, there's kind of a fiction here that this is mostly driven by executive decisions. And in fact, it's mostly been driven by congressional decisions. Especially in the last 60 years or so, Congress has really asserted its leadership role in deciding how much to protect public lands by zoning or determining what uses are permissible in particular areas. A turning point in this in this congressional recapture of authority came in the middle 1960s when Congress passed the Wilderness Act. Next slide, please. The wilderness, here's a chart showing the growth in the acreage in the wilderness system, which is the most protective system because intensive industrial uses are simply uh, not permitted in wilderness areas. Um, <clears throat> Congress did something very key in the, in the Wilderness Act, which it's when it said that not one acre gets added to the wilderness system unless it's done through an act of Congress. In other words, the only way you get lands into the system is through congressional act. Um, now, a couple of things about this chart. One is there's a big upward trajectory. <laughs> that reflects the immensity of Alaska because that all came about in the 1980 Alaska Lands Bill, which tripled the size of the wilderness system in, in one act because Alaska is so vast. But notice, the arc is always upward, um, and it goes up continuously and goes up to this day. I mean, Congress adds land to the wilderness system, uh, practically every Congress. Uh, and if you look again at who's in charge politically of the White House or the Congress when this is done, it makes no difference. After the Alaska Lands Bill, the next sharp upward arc, that is the Reagan presidency, when, when the Republicans were in charge of the Senate. Um, and, and so forth. Uh, there is really, this has been a bipartisan enterprise, uh, practically from the beginning, and that's really important to, uh, to uh, keep in mind, um, <clears throat> because Congress has vigorously moved, especially in the last few decades, to uh, uh, put labels like not only park, but national conservation area, and national recreation area, and other restrictive management prescriptions onto how particular acres of land are managed. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this has been uh, popular, as I said. Uh, next slide, only two more. Uh, Congress has greened up the Bureau of Land Management. This used to be its logo on the left. Now look at the logo on the right. And this sort of captures what's happened through congressional decision making uh, in terms of how our land is managed. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Leshy. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce Mr. Phil Rigdon, the Vice President of the Intertribal Timber Council. Mr. Rigdon is also the Natural Resource Superintendent for the Yakima Nation in Washington State. 
like our committee chairman, uh, Mr. Westerman, Mr. Rigdon holds a Master of Forestry from the Yale School of Forestry. You know, until I came to Congress, I didn't realize Yale turned out so many fine foresters. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Rigdon, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, Chef Maisky, that's good morning and, and it just can. I thank you on behalf of um, the intertribal and more than 60 membership tribes I appreciate the opportunity to share some of the lessons of forest conservation from tribal perspective. All of America's forests were once um, managed and shaped and, and were lived upon by our ancestors and the people there. These lands were shaped by us and directly today, uh, you know, 18 million acres of, of that is continuing to be managed with working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I believe the, the Indian, um, the tribal notion of conservation is different from um, that seen on other lands in federal, um, federal ownership. Pursuant to both tribal direction and federal law, tribal forests must be managed sustainably. Um, Indian tribes work with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and other, others to actively manage our forests and other resources within a holistic, integrated approach that strives to um, to simultaneously sustain economic, ecological, and cultural values, the so-called triple bottom line to us. We, separ um, we operate modern, innovative, and comprehensive natural resource programs premised on connectedness among the land, resources, and our people. For example, when we look at a, managing a piece of land, we're not just looking at one resources, we're thinking about the timber value, the habitat resources for our deer, elk, um, impacts to water quality um, the, and, and the impacts to salmon and those things that we value. In our, in a time not so long ago, this used to be called multiple use management um, and, and was practiced on federal lands. Unfortunately, we've seen um, too often federal land managers crippled by single use designations like wilderness area uh, and, and those type of things. They virtually eliminate the ability to respond to bugs, insect disease, and to look at the values of what those forests had previously prepared. Um, um, very rarely will you find designations like wilderness within Indian country. For example, our forest, we have an area called the primitive area, and it's a, an important part that we use for, for traditional purposes. But um, just like, well, there is an emphasis to, to hold it into for, um, into that manner, we function it, and the purpose we will, are willing to go and address insect disease, fire outbreaks, and it's through our tribal leadership that takes a step. No such action or flexibility is possible with some of these federal um, federal laws. With and so I believe forest forest tribal approach is is better balanced. It looks at what the need of the land is and looking at conservation to to solve those things. We protect our resources. Yet we understand that utilization is essential to sustain the health of our forests and meet the triple bottom line. We rely on our forests to provide employment and, and economic opportunities to generate income needed to care for our land and provide services for our communities. I've been given the honor and responsibility to manage our, our tribe's natural resources. I'm accountable to my government as well as to our membership. If we harvest too much, I, I get feedback from members. Um, you know, that, that live and are part of the land. If we don't harvest enough, I also hear it from, from uh, you know, the Yakima Forest Parks and the community members. We, we um, deal with both feedback, and that feedback is personal, from the supermarkets to, to across the dinner table. We get feedback right away onto what we're doing. And I think that, that goes into the direct accountability leads to that balance that is necessary with competing needs. I believe the ultimate, this leads to better conservation of all resources, whether it be wildlife habitat, traditional medicines and foods, or timber itself. Um, it's important to recognize that um, conservation uh, is to, pre to prevent the loss of those values that we want to retain on the land. And you're seeing those type of events happen across the landscape in, in manners. And it is the tribes using co-management and stewardship opportunities, working with communities, the NGOs, and, 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 
and, and taking the lead in those statuses to implement projects. It's maintaining the forest infrastructure that's necessary to do the habitat work that is both for wildland fire and, 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 and reducing those type of risks, but it's also restoring salmon. It's restoring watersheds. It's making sure that we're doing the balanced approach that is necessary for us to be successful and to make sure that we leave something behind. You're seeing these catastrophic fires throughout the West that are destroying hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of acres. We believe there's a role that tribes and the communities play into making sure that those are protected and managed in better ways. And with that, I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Rigdon. When you refer to across the dinner table, are you saying your wife um, gives you advice now and then? I, I'm not married for one thing, but oh, okay. my, I, my family members will, will, will my, you know, will talk to me quite a bit about what we're doing. <laughs> a lot of times it's at Safeway where you get caught by your auntie. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony. The chair will now recognize members for five minutes for questions. Uh, first, uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Perry, you mentioned the federal government owns about 63% of the land area of the entire state of Utah, 80% uh, of Nevada. Uh, it owns 47% of California, and including 93% of Alpine County. Now, just for fun, Look at the seat of the federal government here in Washington, D.C. All of our federal buildings, our memorials, our national parks, all the federal land in the federal capital. How much of that do you believe is federally owned? The, the, the answer is 25. I wouldn't have an idea. So. 25 percent. Mm. Uh, the federal government owns just 3 percent of Texas, uh, less than 1 percent of the entire state of New York. And yet nearly two thirds of your state, uh, uh, four fifths of, of Nevada, nearly half of California. What happens when the federal government owns so much of your local land? Is, is that land on the local tax rolls? So, so no, that land is not on the local tax rolls and it has a significant impact on the local economy, on um, outcomes, especially when you have um, heavy handed policies like NEPA that have be been used as a tool to restrict our ability to manage those landscapes. Um, local, you know, decisions are made best when they're made by a local community and local involvement. We know what's going on within our, within our areas. It's just and human nature that the most jealous guardians uh, of, a, of a, uh, a community are the members of the community, not some far off government in, in, in Washington. Uh, uh, obviously, um, the, the, the uh, federally owned land is highly restricted as far as any kind of productive use, correct? That's correct. So commerce slows, tax revenues disappear. Now, we're told this is to protect the land. How well would you say the federal government takes care of that land? Um, it's essentially an absentee landowner. So basically abandoned. They you know, Louis Gohmert once, once compared the federal government's land policies of recent years to, to the old town miser whose dilapidated and, and neglected mansion is overgrown with weeds, his paint is flaking, uh, as he spends all of his time and money scheming up ways of buying his neighbor's property. Uh, shouldn't the federal government take care of the land it already holds before acquiring still more lands? I believe so. Uh, what would you, uh, uh, how would you compare the condition of the federal lands in Utah with those of, of privately held or even state managed uh, forests in your region? Um, so we actively manage our forests as a state and they're in good, you know, in, in the, the drought has had a significant impact on the state of Utah, but comparatively our forests are well managed as a state better managed than the federal and, and, and how does that compare to the federal government lands? They're, they're better managed. Um, certainly, in act, I'm a big believer in active landscape management in, um, in, in land stewardship. In my state, you can actually tell the boundary lines <laughs> between the federal lands and the private lands simply by the condition of the forests on, on, the, on that side of the property line. And those who say that, well, it's climate change, uh, how clever the climate to know exactly where the boundaries are and only decimate the federal lands. Uh, Mr. Espy, what are your observations from Wyoming? Um, thank you. Um, yes, um, my observations would be that the land that has been managed within our forest system, and I can personally attest to that, 
Um, my family does own 400 acres inside the Medicine Bow Route National Forest in the Sahara Madre Range. In the 90s, we went in and did a select cut within that property. When you drive down the highway in the summer, you cannot notice that that select cut occurred but now it stands out because that is where the healthy trees are. And when the, the beetle infestation came through our forest, it did not affect the trees on our private property up there. And, and there's a reason the for trees. that, isn't there? Because you match the density of the trees with the ability of the land to support it. So those trees are healthy and strong. And when a bark beetle uh, uh, digs in, it immediately exudes sap, kills the beetle, and that's the end of it. The highly stressed, morbidly overgrown federal lands, all because of NEPA restrictions, uh, 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 have decimated those trees. And it's just, they're, they're weak, fighting for their lives, trying to claim the, the, the same soil as other uh, trees, competing for the same. Uh, this, is, this, is, this has been the story over and over again. They're stressed, they become diseased, they fall victim to disease or pestilence or drought or ultimately, and ultimately catastrophic wildfire. Mr. Rigdon, just in a, a brief moment, how would you compare your tribe's management of lands compared to the adjacent federal lands? I think it's very similar, and, and when you go, and you can go across the country to our reservation on, in South Central Washington and see adjacent lands and, and how we approach management versus adjacent things. There, there's been tours out in Muscalero, and you see the so, national forest so right next. excessive federal land ownership is not protecting our forests, it's destroying them. Thank you, I yield back. Gentlemen yields. I'd like to recognize Ms. Kalmblogger Dove for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you to all of the witnesses here today. You know, I too um, believe in um, to Mr. Rigdon's um, point in tribal definitions of conservation um, being different from our current interpretation. But I think it's mostly because um, the lands that we're talking about are, you know. It's the result of American colonization and a patriarchal view of how indigenous people should live, but I know that this hearing is not about that. Um, before I ask my question, I would also like to just invite um, all of us here to um, view an exhibition. It's called A Forest for the Trees, and it really visually reimagines our relationship um, to nature done through um, cultural mythology, not knowledge, and wisdom of um, tribal lands um, and those sovereign bodies. And it really does talk about fire, it talks about water, it talks about land, and it talks about wildlife. Um, but once again, I know that this is not the committee for that, um, but I do wanna share because I was thinking about that exhibition while I was listening to all of you um, and how we interpret um, preservation, conservation, multiple use, um, and exchange. My question is for Mr. Leshy. Um, today's hearing is focused on conservation of federal lands and forests. And with that in mind, can you elaborate on the importance of protecting national forests and safeguarding water supplies for downstream users? Thank you very much, Ms. Kamlager Dove. Dove. <coughs> and um, uh, happy to elaborate. Uh, and as you know, in Southern California, uh, California is actually a, a kind of a, a premier example of how the federal lands have been used, uh, set aside and used to protect watersheds. That was the reason why they were, the system was created back in the, mostly in the la last decade of the 19th century and first couple of decades of the 20th century. The San Gabriel Mountains, the Sierra Nevada Mountains, mostly national forest land, because those were the vital water supplies for people downstream. And that system came about because local people petitioned for it all over the West. Um, and in the East, we have a lot of federal lands. They were all acquired from willing sellers into national ownership to protect the upper reaches of the watersheds for the same reason. So the story of the National Forest in particular is a story of local people organizing and advocating to protect those watersheds, which are so vital to their way of life. And, and over the years, it's, it has been a, a big success story, so we should celebrate it. I know it's hard to celebrate uh, things coming out of Washington as being good but uh, these days, but uh, the, these public lands are a real political success story in that sense. Absolutely, and I think we should celebrate that. Um, Lord knows I'm looking for things to celebrate. Um, 
In your experience, are bedrock environmental protections included in laws like NEPA a barrier to achieving the most desired outcomes? Um, I have uh, dealt with NEPA actually uh, on public lands issues for 50 years. I've seen it uh, uh, from all perspectives, inside government, outside government. Um, it is not really a barrier, and none of these other laws are really barriers. Um, and, uh, and studies have shown that over and over, actually. Uh, that's not to say there can be tweaks that could you know, improve the process, but they're a way, in particular, for ordinary citizens on the ground in these local areas to have their voices heard. The, the NEPA process and processes like that, the federal land management uh, planning process is a is a way for local people to make their voices heard, and I think it's been generally uh, very successful. So it's it's vital to protect that. Again, not to say you, you can't tweak it and 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 do a little improving here and there, but I, I think uh, doing away, away with it would be a grave mistake. Thank you. You know, I have a criminal uh, justice background, so I like to think of it as uh, somewhat similar to due process making sure that folks have a say and that there are checks and balances. So with that, thank you for your uh, answers to my questions. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Uh, the gentlewoman yields. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Leshy, uh, you said something I really liked. You said that a lot of these public lands decisions went through Congress, and they had bipartisan or at least congressional support the executive branch signed off on it and signed it into law. By contrast, we have the Antiquities Act, and we have presidential proclamations, executive orders designating what started out as antiquities and has morphed into hundreds of thousands or millions of acres of designations uh, by the executive without congressional buy-in or signing off. And an example of that was in Colorado recently. Uh, the Camp Hale uh, uh, de designated area was done by President Biden about a year ago, and it was done without congressional support. In fact, the Republicans whose area this encompassed were opposed to this. A lot of Civic groups and citizens were opposed. Sure, there were some people in favor of it, no, no doubt about that. And tribes were opposed. And here's an example of a tribe. Uh, this is the Ute, uh, the Ute Indian tribe said in an article dated uh, October 13th, and I would like uh, unanimous consent to enter this into the record. Okay, thank you. And they're quoted as saying, they moved forward with a monument on our homelands without including us. They talk about tribal consultation, but their actions do not match their words, the Ute Business Committee said. We cannot support a monument on our homelands that, that does not include the tribe. They also said, this unlawful action by the president today is a desecration of our ancestors that remain buried on our homelands. Many of these Ute ancestors passed on, seeking to protect these lands from further encroachment and others left us as part of the forced death march at the hands of the United States as we were moved out of Colorado at gunpoint. In a statement, the tribe said it had learned of Biden's plans to establish the monument just days earlier. Tribe leaders requested a call with the White House, although there was, quote, little time for the tribe to share its knowledge and history of the area, they said. And in contrast, the White House, I think, was not telling the truth when they said, they made repeated references to the Ute tribe on Wednesday, including a promise in the proclamation to, quote, meaningfully engage with tribal nations with cultural ties to the area, including the Ute tribes, in the development of the management plan and to inform subsequent management of the monument, end quote. So what I see is an abuse of the process when the executive branch will go in and not work with Congress. They'll take areas that Congress would not have passed on its own and designate to become a um, national monument. Not a, not a National Park Service national monument, which is a different category, but an executive branch created national monument under the Antiquities Act. And I think that that's an abuse. Uh, doing this for hundreds or millions of acres at a time, I think is, is wrong. And not consulting with Congress or all of the people who were affected by the, in the local uh, 
decision making that should have been included. I think that that's an abuse. Uh, what do you say to that, Professor Leshy? Thank you, Mr. Lambert. Uh, with all respect, I have a, a very different perspective. Uh, on Camp Hale, I think it had substantial support among the congressional delegation in Colorado and among the tribes. Not in here, area. and it was my district. Um, let, I think the Antiquities Act story uh, is not one of executive seizing power. Uh, it didn't morph into something. The Antiquities Act passed in 1906. In 1908, uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, set aside 800,000 acres under the Antiquities Act in the Grand Canyon. Uh, now, he did that unilaterally, but um, 11 years later, Congress made it a national park. The year after that, the Supreme Court, uh, in reviewing the, the lawfulness of what Roosevelt did, unanimously said it was lawful. That set the pattern. Uh, what's happened since is, yes, executives have used that power, but in almost every case, Congress has ratified it, supported it, done, um, uh, uh, maybe tweaked the boundaries by legislation okay, or let whatever. Let me interrupt for just a second. Uh, the gentleman from Utah, what about the situation in Utah with the Bears Ears uh, area? Yeah, um, thank you, Congressman. Um, yeah, that certainly is a different situation in Utah and one that we're grappling with that has a significant impact and one that was addressed by the Trump administration and reversed by the current administration that um, has, has decimated portions of our state. It just has. And it's a real problem. There wasn't broad congressional support. We didn't have these types of actions to come occurring. Well, thank you, both. thank you both for your comments, and I would just say we should have a process that has more consensus and buy-in from everyone affected. With that, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields. I'd like to recognize the ranking member for five minutes. I thank the chairman. I uh, wasn't planning on addressing this, but just, just at the top here, have nothing but uh, great respect for my uh, colleague, uh, distinguished colleague from Colorado. I presume he misspoke with respect to Camp Hale, and that perhaps he was referring to Brown's uh, Canyon in his district. So just to be clear, Camp Hale, so that we're all familiar with this, is in my district. I represent Eagle County. I represent Camp Hale. Camp Hale was designated National Historic Site by President Biden last year. The project had the support, the, the designation had the support of me as both the representative for that district and as chairman of the Subcommittee on Public Lands, the support of both of our United States Senators, the support of our governor, the support of veterans both within Colorado and across the country who recognized the need to honor our nation's veterans, World War II heroes, who trained in my district at Camp Hale before they defeated the Nazis in the Italian Alps. It was supported by the Ute and Ute Mountain Ute. I understand there are criticisms from some about the designation, recognizing that, but I just wanna make sure factually, with respect to Camp Hale, and as you could probably sense, some level of defensiveness on my part because I'm very proud of that designation. I'm proud of the steps that we took to honor our nation's veterans and veterans in my community. With, with the gentleman you for one second. Sure. Uh, you're, you're right, I was confusing Hale and Browns Canyon. However, uh, Hale used to be in my district. So, sure, I, so <laughs> I, I apologize for, for that overlap. No problem. Uh, and I agree with many of the things, things you've just said. It's just that these, this whole process, I think, needs to be reformed, and I'll yield back. I, I thank the gentleman. A couple questions uh, for Mr. Ferry and Commissioner Espy. Uh, first, I just want to talk a little bit about the Wilderness Act. I, I, think this, I want to make sure that we're all operating under the same set of facts. I, Executive Director Ferry, welcome to the committee. I previously served uh, in a similar capacity as the Executive Director of a different cabinet agency under then Governor Hickenlooper. So very deep appreciation for the job that you have under Governor Cox in Utah. Uh, I guess I wonder, I, I presume you support the Wilderness Act, I, it, the, the DNR is not, I understand you have some concerns about NEPA, which we could talk about, but more broadly, Wilderness Act is not something that the department opposes under no, Governor that, Cox. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and, and that makes sense, right? Because Republican presidents and Democratic presidents have signed into law a wide variety of wilderness designations since the enactment of the Wilderness Act over 60 years ago. President Reagan famously uh, had enacted bills or signed bills into law that designated over 8 million acres uh, within the West as wilderness. I am curious if you know, Director Ferry, or if you could tell us how many acres of wilderness have been designated and signed into law in your state by President Biden? Um, under the current administration, I know that we're working through a couple of designations now. I'm not sure of the exact acreage, but. I, I but, can tell you, I, I can tell you the answer is zero. Yeah. Is, there's none in Utah. 
Um, Commissioner Espy, I presume you know as well, or you can answer this question, but how many acres of wilderness have been designated in the state of Wyoming under President Biden in terms of being signed into law? Um, none. None. That there is a bill. I understand you know, there's bills the pending, but you know, President Biden has been in office for over two and a half years now. None in Wyoming, none in Utah. I also am sure you are familiar, Director Ferry, with this. How many acres of wilderness were designated under President Trump in your state? Um, we did pass a Wilderness Act impacting Utah. Uh, that was a collaborative effort between the local that had broad support. And let me say, I, I wasn't in Congress back then, but I, I marveled from afar. I was supportive of it uh, because it was uh, led by my good friend from Utah, my colleague, uh, Mr. Curtis. And I thought, boy, if I get elected to Congress, I'd love to be able to do something similar. The Emory County yep. Public Land Act, right, which protected 660,000 acres in Utah. 660,000 acres. Also, 217,000 acres in San Rafael, which I'm sure you're aware of land that was pulled back in terms of withdrawing from mineral and mineral leasing, which I'm sure Mr. Curtis can talk a bit more about, but I'm, you're familiar with that, Mr. Yes. Ferry. Yeah. Yes. So uh, my broader point is, and again, these are actions I support. <laughs> I support the protection of public lands and conserving public lands. And I just hope that my colleagues will strike this balance as we're talking about this, because there's a lot of talk about the Biden administration and the 30 by 30 initiative, so on and so forth. And as I hear from the witnesses gathered today, from uh, states that uh, are neighbors uh, to my uh, state, I don't hear much in terms of uh, juxtaposed against what's happened in the past under the Trump administration, uh, the, the, the kind of hyperbole that I've heard from my colleagues about public lands uh, you know, being taken off uh, the, the table for any kind of use and so on and so forth, just isn't matching up with uh, the realities that I see on the ground. Uh, and I see my time has expired. I had some questions about shared stewardship, but I will save that uh, for the future. I thank the witnesses for being here. I take it the gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. And next I'd like to recognize the gentleman from the aforementioned state of Utah, Mr. Curtis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Negus, uh, we do have so much uh, to, to share in our districts that are similar. And I, I thank you for bringing up the Emory County Public Lands Bill. I actually made a big note as you were speaking about that. And, and I think something very, very unique about that bill is um, it was supported by the county commissioners. It was supported by the governor. It was supported by myself, the full de delegation from Utah. And we found agreement on over a million acres of public land on how that should be used for recreation, for extraction, for preservation. Um, and we did it by consensus. And we did it by working with the local people and with their support. And in contrast, I think too many of our discussions here are this top-down Washington approach of mandating what will be done in somebody else's district. There is a bill that gets introduced every Congress with dozens of members from your party legislating public lands in my district. That would overturn the Emory County Public Lands Bill. You can imagine how that makes my constituents feel who worked so hard to find consensus on this. And one of the reasons they did it is they wanted to avoid the ambiguity moving forward that somebody would come into their town and legislate. And, and Mr. Perry, how many Utahns have you ever come across that felt like it was a good idea to destroy the land and leave it worse than they found it? None. None. I can't find a Utah that thinks it's a good idea to destroy our land and not leave it better. Yet, too often, from Washington, D.C., by people who have never been there, we tell them how this land should be managed. Now, you'll, in, you'll indulge me for just a minute. I f took a few tweets um, off the internet from my colleagues across the aisle about DC uh, and the recent bill dealing with the United States Congress messing in their ability to legislate crime. This isn't it. DC has a right to govern itself like any state or municipality. Next one, supporting a home rule by definition means allowing DC government to make its own decisions. Next one, no one but the DC government should be in charge of local policy decisions. If that's true, where we constitutionally have a responsibility to legislate in DC, where we live here in the community, 
where we understand the nuances of crime. How is that not true thousands of miles away where we've never been there, many of us, and we're making decisions and legislating to them? And I would just appeal to this group to understand this philosophy that those on the ground understand best and care the very most about preserving and protecting this land. In my district, I have a unique characteristic. You have a little bit of it, I have a lot of it. About 80% of my district has 90% of its land public land. Now think about that. If you're a local government and you're trying to raise property taxes to pay for schools, for roads, for police, and for fire, and 10% of your property produces property tax, and you have colleagues here in Washington, D.C., telling you they don't think you should be able to make any money on public lands or that you should have no ability to influence those decisions, you can see why we have conflict on these issues. So thank you for indulging me. I'll get off my soapbox. Mr. Perry, let me get to a little bit more specific and let's talk about permitting reform. Somehow in the state of Utah, we're permitting much quicker than they are here in Washington, D.C. when we involve the federal government, and yet nobody's complaining about violations of, of the environment and things like that. Can you share some insight why Utah is so much better at this? Well, as, as a state, we have that uh, ability to plan and prepare and to make decisions that uh, can be impactful immediately. When we, um, when we look at the, the risk that exists, um, to do something as simple as, say, a controlled burn to mitigate you know, old growth forest and to try to regenerate that forest, it takes five years. We don't know what the weather is going to be like in five years. We know we can do it now. And without that immediate ability to respond to current conditions, it's really hard to manage these landscapes. I'm going to interrupt you because I have 23 I, seconds left. And Congressman Ndugus and I co-chair uh, the Wildfire Caucus, and I appreciate his leadership on that. Can you give us in just a, a tiny, tiny nutshell what we're doing that's successful in Utah? So the Shared Stewardship Program, Fantastic program, partnership between the state and the federal government. We're also managing, WRI is specifically um, private landscape watershed management that we're doing that's really, really impactful. These are thank, fantastic programs. Thank you to and all of our witnesses, uh, to you and all of our witnesses, Mr. Chair. I'm out of time. Unfortunately, I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman from, are you from Oregon? Yes, well, it's great to have you on this subcommittee, and um, welcome, and you have five minutes. Thank you. I'm not actually on the subcommittee, but I'm coming here because um, this is really important to me. Um, but I would um, Terrific. like to yield my time to uh, Ranking Member Nagus. And thank well, you. A couple things I'd say. First, welcome uh, to the commissioner. Of, uh, of labor, of those of you who don't, aren't familiar with Ms. Hoyle, who was elected to Congress to replace the infamous and uh, distinguished chairman of the Transportation Committee, Mr. DeFazio, that, that many of you worked with. Uh, she's a former statewide labor commissioner and, and I know is going to serve uh, well in the United States Congress and bring her wealth of experience in her particular district uh, of public lands and, and forest and watershed protection to this uh, uh, esteemed body. Just quickly, and, uh, then, and then perhaps maybe I'll yield a moment to Ms. Kalmandra, uh, got some extra time to talk about shared stewardship. So, and this builds off of a point that Mr. Curtis uh, raised, and I know he stepped out of the room, but him and I have very similar districts. My district is roughly 60% public land. So, uh, you know, many of you are probably familiar with Rocky Mountain National Park, White River National Forest, Arapaho Roosevelt National Forest, some of the most iconic places in the country, all of which I have the honor of representing. So I understand well uh, the uh, uh, the challenges and the obstacles that Mr. Curtis mentioned, and, and I'm grateful for our partnership on some of these issues around wildfire mitigation. And to that end, I, what I'd like to talk about, and Mr. Ferry, hoping you might be able to provide, uh, expound on this in greater detail, is wildfire management, mitigation, resiliency. I was a bit struck, I, I must say, by uh, your response to Mr. McClintock's question, uh, in which you identified the, the federal government, I think the word you used, and I'll give you a chance to clarify this if you'd like, was absentee landlord with respect to the federal lands that are in your district, and or, excuse me, your state. And, and I guess I, I'm happy to give you an opportunity to expound upon that if you'd like, or perhaps clarify that remark, because as I look at the body of work that's being done, under Governor Cox, in partnership with the federal government, in partnership with the Forest Service chief, 
uh, implementing the infrastructure law. I know just two months ago, the Forest Service announced a series of landscapes that will receive treatments. Two of them are in Utah. Um, the Pine Valley landscape, 443,000 acres over the next seven years. The Unita, uh, I'm sure we're not pronouncing it. Uinta. Uinta uh, National Forest, 105,000 acres. Uh, I saw from some of your own written testimony, hundreds of millions of dollars that are being deployed, federal dollars in partnership with the state in Utah to get a handle on the mitigation that needs to be done in our forests. And I think that's really important work and it's consistent with the shared stewardship model that the Utah Department of Natural Resources advertises on its own website. So I was very struck when you said absentee landlord. Um, maybe that's been your experience in the past, but I, my sense is the last couple of years, we're seeing generational investments in terms of addressing some of the needs in, in my national, in the national forests that are in my district, and it sounds like in Utah as well, but happy to give you a chance to yeah, respond. Yeah, no, thank you, and I appreciate that opportunity to clarify. So specifically referring to some of the, the designations on national monuments as well as um, wilderness areas where we can't go in and do some of these treatments that are necessary. On the, 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 the national forest side, we have a fantastic um, forestry program and a partnership with the federal government, with, with USDA, um, and that shared stewardship is part of that partnership. Um, where we are able to go in and work together. And that, that, that shared stewardship clears some of the boundaries out of the way, mm -hmm. specifically when we talk about uh, you know, some of the permitting and other things, that it, it helps streamline that process. And that's part of this collaborative effort I think that we need as we look across the aisle, as we look across agencies from state to federal and local agencies as well to um, really incorporate and come up with positive outcomes that we really need within Within, the risk is so great. We look at the, the catastrophic wildfires throughout the West. Utah's no different. I mean, in, in you know, in, in the, the, this, the WUI, the wildland yep. yeah. um, urban interface is so dramatic and we see people moving into these areas that the catastrophic risk is, is just through the roof. And so we have a great partnership and I, I thank you for letting me clarify that. No, and that's very helpful. And that's exactly what I was, I, I I just want to make sure we're giving the Biden administration credit where it's due. I mean, it's working in Utah. It's working in Colorado. The shared stewardship model with the Forest Service implementing uh, the laws that we passed last year, the bipartisan infrastructure law, it's working. And we just got to do more of it over the course of the next few years. I, I have 10 seconds that I could yield to my colleague from the, <laughs> the great state of California if she has a word. But... <laughs> No, I just wanted to add how heartened I was to hear um, some of my colleagues' statements around building more consensus and having more buy-in from everyone and um, making sure that people on the ground who understand best what's needed are involved. And I think we should be thinking about that as we are hoping to stall any kind of wildfire sale on NEPA and its guardrails. Gentleman yields. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Magoos, congratulations as a ranker. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> congratulations as a ranker. I uh, really appreciate your comments, and be, I know you're busy, but before you leave, I want to thank you for co sponsoring from Lake uh, Winnie Land Exchange. It made all the sense in the world, and, and I, I appreciate your leadership. Uh, Mr. Tiffany, congratulations on your chairmanship uh, from Northwest Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, Northwest Wisconsin, Northern Minnesota, uh, our, our, our uh, communities touch each other, our districts touch each other, and we have a huge federal uh, land uh, footprint. Uh, and we struggle with wildfires, lack of access, and general management issues just like Western states do as well. And I think for the first time that I can tell, there have never been two Midwesterners sharing energy and minerals resources and the federal land. So I'm really excited to, for your leadership. Commissioner Espy, thank you for joining us today. Uh, in my previous role, uh, I served as a, a county commissioner in St. Louis County, uh, Minnesota, where we also have significant amount of federal land. Your testimony discussed the benefit of Wyoming investing in the Good Neighbor Authority for wildfire management, along with other examples of agreements between federal agencies and states, tribes, and private landowners. What are the benefits to counties of these sorts of agreements, and what else can we do in Congress to let you better manage your lands in your county? 
one of the uh, the good neighbor authority, one of the, the biggest advantages to the county is uh, the jobs that kept our, our mill running while we were waiting for the NEPA to be done on some of the forest ground to to help provide those timber products back back into our mill and with that good neighbor authority where we could use pri pull private state and federal lands all into a, a large enough sale or um, um, that the that it was worth the time for the mill to come in and, and mm -hmm. actually go in and do that. What is the, you just mentioned the NEPA process on federal lands. How long is the process, what's going on? <clears throat> um, it, it depends and you know, simple EAs, you know, can be done very, very quickly normally w within the deal. When we get into the EISs, and, and I'm gonna use Choke Cherry Sahara Madre Wind Project that uh, was supposed to be fast-tracked through the process and it's over 10 years in the NEPA process. Uh, the, uh, the, the cumbersome and like for the timber sales and some of this are forest rangers aren't there long enough to complete the NEPA process. So when the, the line officers and those that are there weren't there when we started the project, they, they don't know what precipitated all this. So get a lot lost in, in. Well, I, I don't mean to cut you off here. My time is limited. However, uh, we're gonna have a, a markup on a permitting reform uh, on this Thursday. Um, and that's exactly what we're gonna discuss, the length of time. One mine in Northern Minnesota is on its 20th year of permitting in the biggest copper nickel find in the world called the Duluth Complex. Uh, Mr. Ferry, thank you for mentioning 30 by 30 in your testimony. We recently had a 225,000 acre mineral withdrawal that includes a ban on taconite, copper, nickel, cobalt, and more. Uh, and other uh, essentials in the Superior National Forest, which is a working national forest in my district. Uh, the administration uh, press release proudly included the withdrawal as part of the 30 by 30 goal. So in effect, the administration was spiking the football and taking lands offline and into more restrictive management. I'd like to give you an opportunity as a land manager yourself to discuss how further restriction of lands in the form of national monuments, mineral withdrawals, or anything else is actually detrimental to the lands and our local communities. Yeah, uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, ultimately, the ability to um, develop these lands that have precious minerals, other resources is critical. We're not talking about developing everything everywhere, but there has to be a smart way of going about utilizing the natural resources that exist here in our country. And um, clarification within the 30 by 30 and setting some parameters so that we have an understanding. Because these take significant investments. It's no different than um, investing in a new mill or something else. It takes a, there's a payback that has to occur. And without that security on the back end, the investment doesn't get made. Excuse me, both the certainty uh, and um, of, of the permitting process. Exactly. That's a big part of it too as well. Absolutely. I see my time's up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentleman yields, I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Porter, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Utah is home to exceptional national parks and wilderness and protected public lands. One of my best family memories was um, our recent trip to Dixie National Forest um, and to Zion National Park. And it's very clear, having not been back in a couple decades and making a new trip, how much those areas have supported the state's incredible outdoor recreation economy. Um, and the, the beauty and the benefit of having those protected public lands is not lost on the people who live there and are seeing those economic benefits. Mr. Ferry, I've studied your testimony and you really hammer home the importance of collaborating with the federal government to promote conservation. Mm -hmm. On page one, you state that when, quote, the federal government manages significant swaths of land, proactive, collaborative, and smart conservation efforts are critical to maintaining healthy and thriving landscapes and watersheds. And you indicate the success of these collaborations again on pages two and three of your testimony. Now, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary tells us that co defines conservation. It says conservation, a careful preservation and protection of something 
especially planned management of a natural resource to prevent exploitation, destruction, or neglect. What do you think of that definition? Does that do a good job of defining conservation? It so sounds like a straight out of the book definition. It is straight out of the book. Now, Republicans on this committee um, define conservation differently. They say conservation is, up quote, a purpose that ensures our public lands provide secure domestic sources of energy, food, fiber, minerals, jobs, and recreation under appropriate conservation standards. Do you think the com the, that definition of conservation aligns with what the dictionary tells us? Um, I, I think that they're, they're different. They're different. So given that, I'm curious how securing domestic sources of energy and minerals, which is the Republican committee definition of conservation, how that fits with maintaining healthy and thriving landscapes and watersheds, that dictionary definition. How do you reconcile those things? Well, I think ultimately we have to look at that landscape scale and say what in an appropriate manner, can we extract minerals? Can we do uh, proper grazing techniques? Can we manage those landscapes in a way that still protects those conservation values? Um, and I think that that can be accomplished because what we're talking about, in the state of Utah, we're talking about 33 million acres are owned by the federal government. And to think that none of those acres are available for any sort of production, I think would be, um, it's not proper. So you see an ability to, at the same time that one is drilling, be conserving? On areas, on landscapes, yes. Okay. Um, you said in your testimony that you were, inc quote, encouraged by reforms made in the Trump administration to weaken NEPA. Mr. Ferry, did you know that according to a recent poll from Colorado College, 64% of Utahns prefer that leaders place more emphasis on protecting water, air, wildlife, and recreation opportunities over maximizing the amount of land for drilling and mining? 75% support a national goal of conserving 30% of America's lands and waters, and 78% supported the creation of new national parks. Are you familiar with those statistics? Um, yeah. They Sound they, sound, they sound right to you. Yeah. So those numbers, which are majorities of people supporting more of a dictionary definition of conservation, um, which is parkland, recreation, over drilling and mining, conserving um, in the dictionary, Merriam-Webster sense of it, um, those numbers probably have something to do with the 80,000 jobs created from tourism to Utah's national parks and the seven billion in annual direct visitor spending. I'm curious, Mr. Ferry, if Congress does what you're asking us to do in your testimony, which is to weaken NEPA and other federal laws that protect and conserve, the dictionary conserve, federal lands, what will happen to the 80,000 jobs that were created by outdoor recreational tourism? How is Utah going to make up the $7 billion in annual direct visitor spending? Um, so I, I think ultimately what we're asking for is, is clarity within NEPA, not to weaken it, but to clarify it so that we have certainty, so that those jobs will exist. We have to a- To shorten it, to shortening the time for review, clarify or weaken? Um, I, I think that that clarifies it. I think that it provides certainty to, an to, to all citizens that rely on these. Uh, Are you finished? I just wanna let you finish. I, well, I think time's up, so. I've, yeah, I yield back. I can elaborate, but. Gentlewoman yields. Like uh, now, I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman. Thank you very, thank you very much, Chairman Tiffany, for welcoming me, welcoming me to your subcommittee for this hearing and for including Wyoming in this important discussion. Commissioner Espy, thank you again for your testimony here and helping elevate the needs of Wyoming to the federal level. One issue I have realized as I have been here in D.C. is that few in D.C. actually truly understand the scope of the federal estate in the West and what the implication of that burden is. So behind me I have a map that just shows Carbon County, your county, Mr. Espy, and it shows the various land ownerships, uh, the brown being BLM, green being Forest Service, 
The interspersed white is private. You've got local government, Department of Energy, et cetera, et cetera. Commissioner, you touched very briefly in your testimony, but can you please repeat how much of your county is controlled by the federal government? Um, 43%, I think, of it is federal government. 48% of the surface estate in Wyoming is owned by the federal government, and 65% of our mineral estate is owned by the, the federal government. Uh, and as you can see in this checkerboard pattern, how complicated it can be when you uh, come from a state or a county where you have this variability of ownership, where you go from federal to private to federal to private to federal to private, and the challenges that that can, it can provide. Could you please describe some of those challenges when you have to deal with this kind of a checkerboard pattern within your county? <clears throat> um, yes. Um, even if an action is occurring on private land, and even if there are fee minerals underneath that private land, if the access to that private land does cross federal land, then that tips NEPA. Uh, even to just drive across the, the public land, then the, the full NEPA can come into, and even to the point of, on my private land, the whole Antiquities Act and, and where you go through and it brings in tribal consultation on on private lands. The it opens a whole door up, even though that is fee surface fee minerals. But because you have to cross federal land, that does open up the whole door onto the private property. And it might just be a road that you have to use across federal land. You know, it's been interesting to me listening to the discussion today about the various uh, programs that have been put in place to allegedly streamline and, and make it so that there can be these collaborative projects and these efforts to, to, to try to address some of this, the, the interface between the state and the private uh, lands and the federal lands. But there are 192 million acres in our National Forest Service. And in 2000, and a portion of those are wilderness. And in 2001, under uh, President Clinton, one of the very th the last things that happened in his administration was the adoption of the roadless rule. And the roadless rule was uh, a designation to deny, that denied access management and use to 58.5 million acres of National Forest Service lands in primarily the Western United States. So really what it was was wilderness by fiat, by executive fiat. It wasn't done through Congress. Congress didn't designate the roadless areas. It was done by President Clinton without the kind of oversight that you would typically see in an equal analysis. In fact, the notice of intent was issued in October of 2019 and the final rule and record of decision was issued in January of 2021. In other words, they didn't follow NEPA. They did violate the Wilderness Act because, as you've indicated, it is only through Congress that we can designate wilderness. But the reality is that these 58.5 million acres of roadless acres are, in fact, managed as wilderness, meaning they aren't part of any of these programs. And so what have we seen over the last 20 years? Catastrophic forest fires, the, out, the, the incredible outbreak of the pine beetle throughout the interior west. In fact, we know from the Forest Service's own documents that in 1997, there was a blowdown in northern Colorado in the Route National Forest, knocked down 13,000 acres of trees in one night. Because it was a wilderness area and a roadless area, they never were able to go in and treat that area. Guess what that is? That's ground zero for the pine beetle outbreak. So we can talk about these various programs that might allow for treating in particular limited areas, but the reality is, is that it is the mismanagement of the National Forest Service lands in the Western United States that have been absolutely destructive, not only to our federal lands, but to our private lands and our state lands as well. And I yield back. The gentlelady yields. Now I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, witnesses, for being here today. I represent Virginia's 2nd Congressional District in the Hampton Roads area. Most federally owned land may be out west, but Virginia is well known for its 2 million acres of beautiful national parks and wildlife management areas. Roughly 10% of our state is considered federal land, most of which is managed by the Forest Service. One third of our nation's forests are located in the southeastern United States. Some are federally managed, but many are privately owned. 
In my district, local private companies are making use of harvested wood products from working forests to produce sustainable alternatives to fossil fuels. These forests contribute greatly to removing carbon from the environment, and for every ton of wood products harvested, almost double that is grown in the same period. That means our carbon sequestration ability is growing year over year, all thanks to sound forest management and biomass production. While working forests in the southeast United States are largely privately owned, federal lands across the country have similar potential to be productive in working forests, removing carbon from the atmosphere and producing sustainable and renewable energy in the form of biochar and wood pellets. To the panel, what progress, if any, are we seeing in federally owned forests being used for these purposes? And can public-private partnerships be used to further enhance the productivity of federal forests? Um, actually, in, in Carbon County, we, we have what's called the, the Lava Project on the Medicine Bow Route National Forest. There's a pellet mill in Jackson County, Colorado, that is, has been able to make use of the timber that can't be used to, is for saw logs. That, can't go into the, the stud mill in Saratoga. So the, the byproduct of the, the stud mill in Saratoga has been pellets. Uh, thank you. I think it's important to recognize that uh, across the country, tribes are out doing the work, our, our places within these communities. And, and we're actually uh, on our own lands, we're harvesting and doing things, but we're reaching out through the Tribal Forest Protection Act and looking at shared stewardship in manners that are consistent with the goals of, of uh, sound stewardship, retaining and making sure that the forest is able to be productive in, in the manner that you're talking about, but also having the infrastructure necessary to be able to do those things with milling and, and other uh, energy opportunities that I think are necessary. So if it's in the Northwest with the ACMA, Colville, Warm Springs to the southwest with the, the Apache, Muscularo, and 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 those tribes to the Midwest with with um, you know many of the tribes that throughout there we're out there actively working with federal agencies and working to to make sure that the, the coast the shared stewardship is a part of our our place and that the tribes play a role into to, into the history of what we believe is important legacy that we leave. Um, a co couple of different points. One is on, on the collaborative uh, working on the forest. Uh, I can tell you from personal knowledge that in uh, Arizona, it's the largest ponderosa pine forest in the country. Most of it is uh, national forest land. There's been an effort ongoing for years that has really taken off in the last couple of years <laughs> to do forest-wide treatments, uh, helped a lot by money from Congress. Um, and so that uh, th this project had been talked about for 15 years. It's, uh, it's widely collaborative local governments, timber industry, environmental groups, they're all behind this. It's called the Four Fry, uh, four, and uh, uh, well worth watching because it's kind of on the leading edge of what's happening uh, around the country. Uh, the other point is uh, unconnected, but, but I wanted to mention, uh, which is um, uh, paying more attention to tribal traditional knowledge in the management of forests is something that has really taken off in the last few years around, uh, around the federal system in particular. Uh, uh, using fire as a management tool in particular is something that uh, indigenous peoples did for a long time and, and the federal land managers and the state land managers are kind of waking up to that fact. So one of the chapters toward the end of my book, I talk a lot about the, the uh, emergence in the modern era of uh, tribal uh, native nation influence over how our federal lands are managed. And the, the traditional knowledge is one aspect of that. And that's really a, it's been, it's gaining momentum and it's really a pretty powerful uh, and progressive, important force. So I just want to make that point. Nice. Thank you. And I yield back the rest of my time. Okay. The uh, gentlelady yields from Virginia. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I'm going to yield myself five time, uh, excuse me, five minutes of time here, and I'll start with Mr. Rigdon. Uh, in your testimony, you stated that catastrophic wildfire is perhaps the greatest waste of forest resources. Um, you can see this chart behind me here as we've seen this decrease in harvest um, on our national forests since the 1980s. And then you see the spiked lines where we see these uh, catastrophic wildfires that are out there. 
Uh, Mr. Rigdon, if the federal government started harvesting timber like your tribe, how do you think the chart behind me would change in terms of acres lost annually to catastrophic wildfires? And th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think I think we'd still have fires, but I think the catastrophic catastrophic fires would would be a lot uh, minimized. And fire is actually can be used as a tool with respect to the land, but because they're overstocked so much right now, because insect and disease, and because of those forest health issues, you're seeing the type of fires that become these mega fires that um, that are destroying everything and losing the values of protecting water, protecting the resources that we all want protected. And so I, I could see the, the, that number coming down, but actually I think we need more prescribed burn or using fire in a better manner. But it, it would take some management to make yeah. that happen, right? To reduce yeah. this threat of these mega wildfires. Yes, Mr. That, Chairman. It, how many um, how many mills have been lost in the West here over the last since this started in the late '80s to now? So, um, on our reservation in Yakima, we we used to have about 300 mills locally that we, we that would go into the Northwest. Now our mill is the only one in our area that's that's left with, with respect to that. You're watching the interior west lose the ability and the infrastructure necessary to be able to do this type of force health and, and this active management approach. Is that something we should really be concerned about is losing those, um, those privately owned mills that used to consume that timber that is now being burned? I think, I think it goes both to the milling infrastructure but also you look at the, the um, there were some studies done with respect to the age of the log, log truck drivers, and, and they're in their 60s. And as you start doing that, the ability to, for someone to, to go and a young person to go get a log truck and start an enterprise, is, that's a challenge that we're going to face that the next generation of public people working in the, in the infrastructure necessary to do that we're, we're seeing that on the reservation. We're seeing that throughout the West. You, you mentioned something, Mr. Rigdon, in regards to you have a designation known as primitive, which I took as to be somewhat similar to the wilderness designation at the federal level. Is that right? Yes. Um, but it, in wilderness, there is basically nothing happens there under the federal designation. Do you do some management on your primitive lands? In um, in, in our primitive, we have an opportunity to deal with things. Um, we do try to stay out of there, and, and we do value the values that it has with respect to, to, to doing that. But we will respond it, to insect disease, uh, and mainly fire, to protect protect the spread of gas rock fire. When so if happens. there was the potential for catastrophic wildfire, let's say there was a severe disease outbreak, something like that. Um, Ms. Hageman mentioned you know 13,000 acres going down. You would go in and deal with that. Is that correct? That that is correct. And and I also want to make sure people, the the committee understands our our land our land is held in trust by the federal government. So we follow all NEPA within the reservation, and we follow all other federal laws that to meet those objectives. And and so people need to understand that it, it, our land is considered federal, um, and is in an ownership on behalf of our our community. And so we do follow those. Would you have any objections to the Good Neighbor Authority being expanded in the upcoming Farm Bill? No, I, I think it's an important tool for for um, the ability for the state, tribes, and, and the communities to work to to um, at doing the the necessary work out there to reduce the risk that you see with um, fire and and the buildup of accumulated fields. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Espy, you mentioned, I don't have a question here, but um, we had this discussion just now in regards to tourism versus industry. And that's how it's always portrayed is tourism versus industry. You can have one or you can have the other. Let me tell you, I sit here as a owner of a business known as Wilderness Cruises, my wife and I owned for 20 years. And I can tell you, when we saw a downturn in the economy, we saw a downturn in our business, which was a tourism oriented business. They are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they require each other. It is so important that we have a growing economy, including growing industry and a robust industry in order for the tourism recreational businesses to be able to survive. It's a very important part of that. And the other thing is that 
we, we saw the slide earlier in testimony about the amount of land continuing to go up, Republican and Democrat presidents. <coughs> and I have no reason to doubt that that chart is not, that is not inaccurate. But I would give you an analogy to another thing that is going up like this here in Washington, D.C. And it's called the debt, where it's approaching $32 trillion. And it was said, so why wouldn't we continue on this merry course of continuing to put more land into the federal treasury? Um, just like the debt, maybe we need to rethink how much more land that we're going to purchase here in Washington, D.C., especially when it's not being managed properly. That concludes my questioning. I'd like to uh, recognize the gentleman from Idaho for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to our panelists, thank you for your testimony and your willingness to be here today. And please understand that some of us that, who bounce in and out are, are not being rude. There's this thing called dueling committees sometimes. But I have been uh, uh, privy to your written testimony and, and on the front end of it. Uh, question for Mr. Rigdon. Uh, Mr. Rigdon, uh, I too am, am very interested in the Good Neighbor Authority and for some period of time been uh, attempting to expand that to tribes, to counties, and the participation there. But you've got a unique perspective on that with your background. I would, and I, I heard just the, uh, the, the exchange here with the chairman on this topic, but I would like to hear your thoughts a little bit further. If that's expanded, Good Neighbor Authority, if that's expanded, where tribes have the access to that tool. To what extent do you think that would be embraced? I know uh, it probably some would embrace it, some would not, but I would like to get your thoughts into to the why and the wherefores there. Uh, and, and thank you, and I, I, I wanna make sure tribes are currently, Yakima Nation is in doing a, a Tribal Force Protection Act 638 contract that this, that. Um, what was passed in the 2018 farm bill, and and the thing is, is we've we've spent our effort working with the Good Neighbor Authority. We signed on with Washington State DNR, and so we're actively out there. And I, I do know but this that, this would include a fiscal participation, which does not exist today. And and that's that's the part is we're using the tools that that we currently have. I I think it would be really important for tribes to be included in that language, and also the ability if going into a stewardship contract within there to be able to retain the receipts so that we could put the resources locally back into in, into there. And that's an important part of what we So you we think receiving. generally they, it would be embraced? Embraced. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, Mr. Ferry, haven't had a chance to interact with, with you yet. And, uh, but I did read uh, your testimony and uh, NEPA, uh, not surprisingly, comes up. Uh, I'm in your neighboring state, yes. and so we share a lot of common characteristics, I think, and I agree with what my understanding is of your position on the need for reform there. This dates back to 1970-something, and here we are in 2023 with a whole different landscape and uh, some need for reform. But um, I would like to get your perspective. There is the, uh, the, the do-nothing route on reforming NEPA, and, and we get that a lot from some of our opposition here. Mm -hmm. What happens if we do nothing on NEPA? Um, I think we see a continued pattern. I think that's a great example of that chart there. We see a continued pattern of increased catastrophic wildfires. We see a continued pattern of not being able to manage in an appropriate way these landscapes, these federal landscapes. Um, we see continued ex increased expenses and cost and really what we're looking for is that, that reform is to help us manage in an appropriate way these large federal holdings and the, and the interaction that exists, because they do have a, a, an interaction. I mean, the, the, the chart that was just demonstrated earlier, um, you have this checkered board pattern of federal to private lands. It has an impact across the board. It has an impact on private lands as well. And so it's critical that we, we at least address these concerns and make it so that we have more surety and, and consistency in our process to be able to manage these landscapes. We have just a little bit over a minute left. I'd like to pulse you on one other thing related. Litigation, when you do get a project that is approved and you move forward with it, how much of a problem have you got with litigation? It's a huge problem. And it's one that, um, it's, 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 that's what the uncertainty is. 
the consistent or constant litigation that occurs that draws these projects out makes them way more expensive than they need to be and just it basically hamstrings us in being able to manage these these lands. Thank you, Mr. Ferry. Mr. Chairman, I just want to make a closing comment here with my last few seconds. Uh, the, the, the full committee chair, uh, Chair Westerman, has had uh, for some period of time the resilient forest legislation that he's got uh, on the table. And one of the provisions in that, one of the reasons that I'm a sponsor of that, a co-sponsor for that, is a, a, uh, a trial run at using arbitration as opposed to litigation in those cases, which I believe you would potentially agree that might be a very positive change, and uh, so we're certainly going to support that. Mr. Ferry for, and uh, Mr. Rigdon, the rest of the panelists, thank you again for your time. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields. Thank you for your questions. Well, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for your testimony. It is greatly appreciated that you would take the time to come here to Washington, D.C., and join us from the far western reaches of our country. And, uh, uh, and I want to thank the members for their questions. Members of the subcommittee you may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing if anyone pr provides those to you. Under committee rule three, members of the subcommittee must submit questions to the committee clerk by 5 p.m. on Monday, March 13th, 2023. The hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there is no further business with, without objection, this committee stands adjourned. Okay.